Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. I am Heather the Painter, and I'm really excited you guys could join us today. Um, I'm probably going to fumble over my words today because Painter 18 has completely rocked everything. And I very rarely say that over an upgrade or over a new tool. And it took me a little bit to get into it because I typically hate change, but then I started diving into it and I had major holy cow moments. And for my fellow photographer and oil painter and calligraphy artists and illustrators, this is a huge, huge breakthrough in technology. And Corel has brought us some really neat organic stroke technology and some really cool transparency features um, that I'm hoping that I can share with you and how to apply real world application. Uh, so let's see. Um, I wanted to talk about painting in a little bit more of an a la prima style. So for those of you that know me, I started out as an oil painter. So these are either oil paintings over Giclée prints or freehand oil paintings. Um, a la prima is a term that's typically referred to as an all-in-one session, or it is a term for painting wet into wet. And you get those beautiful, chunky, heavy textural strokes. and Painter's new thick paint has got me so beside myself because it has now given us really nice, realistic a la prima strokes. So that's what we're going to kind of focus on today. Um, so these are actual uh, painting um, acrylics and oils. So we now get this digitally, and it's completely got me rethinking my workflow here, because normally I would do a little digital painter and then maybe paint freehand. Um, so, you know, without further ado, let's go dive into Painter 18. And if you guys have not checked out their YouTube channel, uh, Painter Tutorials, they have a massive channel. Make sure you subscribe and you'll get updates and notifications when they add their tutorials. So in Painter 18, we've got the welcome screen. We're going to close out of that and get right into it. Now, there's so many new tools that they've introduced, but I'm only going to focus on a couple of them, uh, mainly thick paint, transparency, and what their new cloning capabilities offer. So um, I am going to open up right now a blank document file new. And just to keep it really clean, I'm going to offer a white background. Now with the new brushes, I'm going to go to thick paint. And I'm going to show you the oils palette knife. Let me hit reset. And what's really cool about these, you'll notice on thick paint, they make their own layer. So as we apply, and I'm using a Wacom Intuos Pro Medium tablet right now, and I'm using the additional art pen so I get that nice barrel rotation, you can see that you get almost this slightly randomized, broken edge. It starts to splay its bristles. You get that nice um, random edge-breaking effect that you normally only get with organic paint. So this is really exciting to me because in previous versions I found I would have to apply a few different type of strokes to get that same look or a few different types of brushes. Now what's even cooler about this is if you are into any kind of graphic design, um, calligraphy, freehand lettering, all my people wanting signatures out there if you want to do this yourself, um, if you're familiar with clipping masks, this is for you. So if we pull up jet black on our color wheel or a grayscale, thick paint is automatically going to make a new thick paint layer. And my oils palette knife I really like. It's pretty thick uh, with our paper texture being set to basic paper as thick paint is highly dependent on your paper texture that's set. Now you can see this is with basic paper. If we were to set this to artist canvas, which is one of my favorites, 
I'm actually not seeing it change that much, but you can see it with some of the other grainy brushes it will change. But just because Artist Canvas is my favorite, I'm going to leave it there. Let's change that up. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about these settings up here and just make a few tweaks to it. Um, as we go up along the top, this settings bar reflects whatever current tool is selected. So we have our reset tool, <coughs> which resets your brush to its last save settings. Freehand, straight lines, align to path, size. We have opacity, or how much coverage you're getting. Um, we have the amount of load, which it, I kind of think of this as dry out. So if you have it at 100%, that means your brush is loaded for a very, very, very long time. Or you can click up here at infinite paint, and it just means your paintbrush never runs out of paint. You can keep going and going and going and going. I kind of like putting this at 50% and under. So I'm kind of right now, I'm kind of finding like 30, 40 is my happy place. So you see how at 40% it starts to run out of paint. So I kind of think of this as like dry out. So this is their load feature. If we go at 20%, you can see how it's starting to run out of paint even faster. If we go down to 5%, we just run out of paint very quickly, which will force you to make very quick marks. So I'm going to go back up to 40% because I really like that for my calligraphy. So I think this was um, 5%, 20%, 40%. So that's the load feature. As we move over, we have bleed. If, you watch, if you've watched any other webinars with me, you know bleed is how much it blends with the underlying paint. In this case, because it is not blending with underlying layers at this point, it's only affecting that current layer that it's on, the thick paint layer. This is how much it's interacting with the paint on that layer. So if you're going to be doing hand drawing lettering, um, you want really clean lines and you don't want it to interact with other paint colors, I would put this down to zero. So I'm going to put this to zero and I'm going to make a mark. And I'm pretty happy with that. That's kind of cool. Let's do another one. I'm going to undo. So we can get really cool signatures with this. I'm actually going to force my load to a little bit lower. Let's go to 30. I'm going to make another thick paint layer. Sorry, new thick paint layer. And now I have a C and an H that I can use as a clipping mask. And you can YouTube that or Google it. Um, it's a very easy editable mask. Uh, for unlimited editing, for you know applying color, using as a signature, <coughs> using in your graphic design, but it has to be a grayscale mask. Now what's even cooler about this is we can take a really wild and crazy brush like the uh, Grainy Oils Jitter. Let's take that one and I'm going to make a separate layer on my layers palette and go new thick paint layer. Let's do a new one. So this one's really kind of messy. It's got a kind of a clogged round nozzle that spurts. What's neat about this is it maintains transparency on that thick paint layer, which means you can apply blenders to it and get really crazy without picking up anything underneath. So no white artifacting, no ghosting. It just keeps that grayscale layer for future clipping masks. So let's go pick up a blender. And I'm going to go find a blender. And let's try stencil oily blender. And I'm going to turn these off just so you can see what I'm talking about. And I've got to make sure I'm on my thick paint layer. Now here, the only way that you can apply other brushes to your thick paint layers is to turn your thick paint layer into a default layer. So we're going to right click on this and I'm going to say convert to default layer. 
So now I can have this interact with any of my other brushes that are not thick paint brushes. So now I can take any of my blenders, any of my other brushes, and I'm going to make my brush a little smaller. And these are all brushes found in Painter. Um, straight out of the box, this stencil oily blender. I can mess with that a little bit. And it looks like a really broken, waxy piece of pastel, which could make a really neat signature if you're needing a transparent layer for either a future clipping mask. Um, it's just you get that nice transparency. There is no picking up from underneath layers like in the past. We would get that white ghosting or that white artifacting. Uh, it's totally transparent, which is a huge game changer. So if you're going to save your thick paint layers, it's really important to note that you have got to save it as a RIF file. If you want to open this up in non-Corel programs, like using it as a clipping mask, so photographer people, you're going to have to save this as a Photoshop file. So I'm going to save this, file save as, and I'm going to just name it lettering. And I'm going to save it as a Photoshop file because I would use my clipping masks in Photoshop. So it's really great for when you're doing your hand lettering, for your marketing, for your signatures, for your logos, because you can use your brushes on transparent layers. They're not going to pick up any white ghosting. They're not going to interact with any of your underneath layers. And you can use your thick paint in that. Now to take it even one step further to make it just really, really crazy cool. Corel just thought of all the angles here. I'm just so tickled with this. Let's go back to thick paint. And let's pick up something really cool like heavy texture palette knife. Love this brush. Let me hit reset. That way it's just showing up the same way for you. So I mean, can you see like a clipping mask background out of this? Which means if you apply this to any kind of color or photograph, it automatically clips this to a mask. So say we don't want all of that heavy texture to it. We could actually tell Painter, you know what? Eh, that texture is a little bit too high for me. All you have to do is double click the thick paint layer in your layers palette. And this thick paint layer attributes cop comes up. An amount is automatically default to 50%. I believe this is set in your preferences. We can drop this down to a much lower number, and this will drop your thick paint. You can also adjust your thick paint um, under your lighting. Now let me show what this means in color. So let's put some heavy colors here. Let's do some pretty blues. It's going to get a little bit muddy because I've already started a thick paint layer. So let's delete that black. Get started with a blue. See how it's breaking up and it's very random. It's skipping across the canvas. So what's dependent upon the texture you're going to be getting out of this is whatever your paper texture is set to. So if we change our paper texture, you see we get those little tiny dots coming through. We can change our paper texture at any time. Just know it's not going to retroactively adjust all of your brushwork. So I'm going to put on some very heavy paint. Make kind of a nice little background splotch. Let's add some warm tones. Something really fast. Now if we wanted to adjust all the texture here, because the texture is a little heavy, it's a bit too much impasto for my liking, we would double click that thick paint layer and we would change the amount and I would drop it down to something low. Let's go to 5%. So you see how it kind of drops down the impasto there. So this is more of what it's called thick paint. It's not so much of an impasto layer like it used to be in old versions of Painter. I'm going to even drop this down even further. Let's go to 2%. Okay, I lied. Let's go to 1%. So it's dropped it down quite a bit. Now if this is still much too, if this is still too much texture, too much plow, there is a brush called Depth Eraser under your thick paint brushes. So we can go through that. 
and it would maintain all of the color work, but it would take out that thick paint texture. So we would have some kind of control there. So, you know, you can make gorgeous edges. You've got these beautiful a la prima edges. Um, in the past, we would call these streamers. Um, you know, these the applications here are completely limitless. These look so traditional, natural, like heavy dry paint on top of linen or oil canvas, and it's really, really, really delicious. So if we wanted to have these interact with a traditional brush, we would just right-click on the thick paint layer and say convert to be default and find one of our favorite brushes. So for me, let's see, I pick up one of my everyday brushes. And I'm going to pick up my Wispy Blender. I'd pick up that Wispy just to show you that it can interact now with these. Boop, boop, ba -doo. And it's just interacting with the colors, not with the white underneath. So if we were to uncheck that, it is maintaining transparency. It's not picking up white from the underneath, which means it's not going to pick up image from the underneath, because this guy under right here in the middle is unchecked. So in the past, if you've worked with me before, you know I would always say, make sure this is unchecked, this is checked, I'm sorry, in the past. So pick up underlying color. If we were to select that, so click on that, pick up underlying color is checked, this would actually react with the underlying layer. So now it would react like the canvas is part of the document and it's wet and it's lifting. So if we hid the canvas, now it's picking up underneath it. So if you want to preserve the transparency of that layer, just make sure that this pickup underlying color part is unchecked. So this is really, really cool if you're wanting to paint backgrounds, if you're wanting to get really hard edges, if you want to paint headshots and you have those very heavy edge streamers on the shoulders, on the hair. Um, and you want to preserve all that transparency, so at any time you can change the paper color or the background color. Uh, it's just amazing what you can do with some of these brushes. So let's jump out of here and talk about uh, some of the thick paint brushes and some of the new cloning tools. So I'm going to close out of there. And I'm going to open up a background and start from there. So Painter has now given us the ability to use transparent clone sources, which means this. Let me make sure I'm opening up the right one, and I'll show you how I set it up separately. So this was originally my Dreamweaver background. <coughs> Excuse me. Which... Um, was on here. Here it is. So originally it was that. I changed some of the colors around and just did a few selective color adjustments and color balance so I could get a warmer background for Shia, my little one. And I took some brushes and just changed up a little bit on top. So what clone source in the past would be is we could load up uh, our images in there and clone from that, but it would read it as, you know, from corner to corner as a whole. It would read that as a flat file. What Painter 18 has allowed us to do now is bring in transparent layers, if you will. So you can import them as PNGs or RIFs. Um, so let me open up Ms. Shia. You have two different options. You can either load them in as a texture, or you can load them in as an embedded image. So if we were to load them in as a texture, we have a texture library if we expand that clone source palette. And we have some already loaded in here. Let me back out just a little. Now I don't want you to get confused with the word texture. 
um, it's just a term. So the word texture just means it's going to load it in and attach it um, as a PNG. So we've got different textures we can use. We've got little photo art clippings. Um, I've actually loaded her in as a texture instead of loaded her in as a separate file that would be attached within my document. So if we were going to load in as a separate file attached to the, attached to the document, that would be source embedded image, which I've already gone ahead and done. Now, I'll show you here if we toggle our tracing paper what that looks like. So that's one way of doing it, is loading in your tracing paper. And I'm going to show you from scratch how I did this. So let's see, the best way to do that would be texture. And I remember I opened up my canvas, so I opened up um, my background, the background that I wanted her to be on. You're going to have to put your subject, um, you're going to have to either mask them out or make them transparent if you want to import them as a texture. What I'll, you, what's nice about this is it allows you to clone from them as a transparent item, meaning you can still paint the background as a separate layer, you can paint them as a separate layer, and when you clone from them, it's not going to go over and treat the background as the same layer. So I loaded her into my photo art panel in the texture by going under my clone source palette at the very bottom, and under here there's a little arrow that says import texture. So if you click on the import texture file, you can load a PNG document. So I masked her out. I would use embedded profile. And she's now in here. Now if we want to be able to see all of the little controls and the handles and everything, we would click on show or hide the texture library palette and show or hide the textures panel. So we've got textures, texture libraries. Now we can see Show Texture by clicking on the Show Texture box. So we can see what we've loaded. So just to recap, I'm at my Clone Source palette. My source is Texture. I can show my texture. I'm going to bump that visibility all the way up just to be able to show you what I'm seeing. Now I want to be able to move this around because I don't like where it's placed it. So I really like that now that Painter 18 has given you capability of moving your clone source, resizing it, rescaling it, all of this good stuff. So to be able to do that, move this out of the way, we're going to go over to the Transforms Textures box by clicking on Move and Size. If you hover over top of it, it actually tells you what it's doing. Let me zoom out so I can see it. And I am going to move her where I'm pretty happy with it. And then we can resize her however we would like. And I would hold down the Shift key so there's no distortion. Now it's going to say any changes that you've made to this will be lost unless you save the texture or you, you save your new clone source, you know, texture. So, okay. I like it where she is. Before we do anything else, we're going to come in here and say textures, save as. And I'm going to name this 25 Shia. Um, and then I would probably line it up with my current document. So set whatever my document is, August 24th. Now, this is going to load this into your texture palette. So you can see she's down here. So if we were to turn this on and off, you can see she is showing up under Source Texture instead of Source Embedded Image. Now you would have to save this as a RIF file as you're closing in and out of Painter. This is one way to do your workflow. You could always do your workflow as using this as an embedded image, which is what I've done in the past. If we want to convert it to an embedded image, we can come over here to that Textures palette again. Over here on this right icon, we can click Export Texture to Clone Source Image. So I like the placement, I like the size, everything lines up where I want it to be. You know, I want to keep working on this document as I close in and out of Painter, so let's embed it as a Clone Source Image for future use. 
So I'm going to embed texture as clone source image. So now, this is what I had set up earlier. So now I've got her as an embedded image. So she is there for, for life of that file, that saved RIF. You have to save it as a RIF if you want to remember that embedded file. Now this will bloat your file size the more images you embed with this document. So Painter is remembering each image that you're sourcing um, as your clone source here. And I know I'm using a lot of technical jargon for beginner users, but bear with me here. So I'm going to dump this one because that's not how I originally set it up to show you guys. And I'm going to show this, I'm going to turn that off. So I've got my actual real world work document already set up for you. And I'm going to hide this because I've got very little screen real estate right now. And it is already saved and ready to go as an uncompressed RIF. So once again, I've got my canvas, my little bits of painting on the top to make it work. And you can see it's preserving that transparency, which I love. Um, by the way, this new feature means that a lot of brushes in the past, especially drip-based brushes like your sergeants and a lot of your artist-based brushes, can be used on a transparent layer. In the past, that was not possible. You had to have existing pixels. Now you can use them on a totally blank layer. It preserves transparency. You don't get that white artifacting. So this is totally heavenly. So I've got that extra layer on top to make some adjustments. Now I can bring in Shia with my straight cloner. Let's go to cloner. So right now I'm going to clone from her as a transparent layer. So I'm just cloning her, not the background, because I really like my background right now. So I'm going to go to straight cloner. Make it a little bit larger. And I'm going to toggle my tracing paper. Command T, or do that little button there. Place her in, and you'll see how it's not over painting any of my background. Oh, you know what? Let me put her on a separate layer. Let's do a separate layer. There we go. So it's not over painting my background because that um, clone source file has got some transparent mask dot areas. So whatever you load into it, if you mask out your subject from your background, it will remember out that it will remember the masking. So now we've got her. And if we need to make adjustments to our background, we can. And you can do this for as many layers as you want. So if you want to do the bow on a separate layer or the hair on a separate layer, um, when I work with students, you can do your makeup on a separate layer. So this gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of room to take risks and try different brushes. So now that I've got my canvas, my background, and my little bug, I'm going to take some fun brushes and let's go into some thick paint brushes now that we've got our document set up. And I'll take questions in just a minute because, goodness, we're flying through time. Um, let's go to Heavy Texture Knife. So Heavy Texture Palette Knife. I'm going to hit Reset. And I'm going to make sure I'm on Artist Canvas because typically my workflow has that set to Artist Canvas at all times. And I am going to use this over top. I'm sampling D. It's a little bit heavy for me, but that's okay. We can adjust that. I'm not going to make any adjustments here. I'm just going to paint. Right now what I want to do is just kind of get some paint on the canvas. Get some of those edges out. So I'm kind of revisiting one that I had painted a while back. But I love that you can get these extra gorgeous edges. And I know they look crazy right now, but bear with me. So I'm using that heavy texture palette knife. So I'm sampling. I'm putting down paint, sampling, putting down paint, and this is all on a separate layer. 
So I'm trying to marry the two. Sample. D brush db db. Now, if at any time I wanted to take that texture to zero, because what I'm really looking for are these beautiful edges. So let's take that flow pretty low. Let's go down to like 20, because that's going to force that brush to dry out faster. And that's what I like. When you get it to dry out, you get that nice broken loveliness. So this is giving me more of that a la prima kind of look. And a nice chunky look. And I know that texture is really harsh, but bear with me here. I'm just trying to make these two come combine. There we go. Now I'm really liking the edges I'm getting. I'm not liking the thick texture. It's a little bit too much. So either I can remove that with my depth eraser which is a bit too heavy, so let's undo that. Or we can just adjust the amount of thick paint by double clicking on that layer. So let's go down to, let's try 10%. Oh, that didn't take it down quite enough. Let's undo that. Try again. Let's go down to 1%. I'm better with that. I really, really like these broken edges, so I'm going to keep this up. Oops, I'm on depth eraser. Let's go back to that brush. We were at the heavy texture palette knife. And once I get to a place that I'm happy with, that I get these gorgeous streamers, I am going to convert this to a default layer and then start using my traditional brushes with it. Let's see, heavy texture palette knife. Let's get some real bristles in here. Let's do some real bristles oils flat. I'm going to hit reset so it looks just like it does on your computers. It's kind of a cool brush. It's a little heavy for me. Let's drop that down to about 30%. Uh, let's go up to about 50%. So I'm just trying to get those broken edges that you get with thick paint that you can't get with any of the other brushes. And I'm sampling what's currently there, and I'm just doodling. I'm trying to get color down on my canvas, but I'm looking for those broken edges. I'm going to change brushes again. Um, let's go for that grainy scraper. Where are you? Grainy scraper. Pushing it around a little bit. I'm just kind of experimenting here. It's giving me a little bit too much plow. I'm going to undo those. All right, so at this point, I'm going to take my thick paint layer, right click on it, and say convert to default layer. So, this means I can now maintain all those beautiful broken skips, but now I can use my traditional brushes. Oops, sorry, hitting the wrong brush here, wrong tool. And I'm going to use one of my favorite little brushes, beginner, oops, let me go my everyday brushes. I'm going to use my Chunky Sergeant Blend. And I need to make sure I'm on the right layer. I'm going to go back in there with my Chunky Sergeant Blend and just go in with a few areas that are too thick painty because I love the texture at the edges here, but they're a little bit too harsh on her dress. So it's just kind of blending the two together. There we go. So we're getting really, really messy. Let me turn my tracing paper on. And I'm going to take my Wispy Blender.
And with this being a much heavier style, there's a lot of back and forth and yelling at the screen. And it's not, you know, the first brush stroke is, yes, this is perfect. So this is a lot of, okay, trial and error. But the thick paint's given me a really good base to go from. And I can always clone back in. Well, um, well, you know, to catch up. you've been doing an excellent job because we haven't had a whole ton of questions, but what I was just trying to explain when you were showing the in the layers for thick paint, how you can make adjustments for the depth, yeah. I just wanted to also mention that you can launch the thick paint panel, ah, which has yes. a ton of other options for a variety of the thick paint brush properties and adjustments which I'm not showing here, thick paint, and dab options, throw or show or hide, there we go. Yeah, there you go. So, um, and I will give a huge shout out, Aaron Rutten has a phenomenal tutorial explaining what every one of these does. So, if you need a, a very in-depth tutorial on how to understand what these are, He's got an excellent tutorial on it. Oh, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm good job, Erin. <laughs> so I'm going to drop, let's see, convert. I'm getting ahead of myself here. All right. So, um, yeah. So feel free to ask some questions because at this point I'm just kind of trying to make it work. Now that I've laid out some of my wispy hard stuff here, because in a real world situation, this would be like many, 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 many hours of trying to build up and play with it and making it work with my image. But the organic brush texture that you can get with these thick paint brushes is insane. They look very real, um, which is just changing my workflow and I'm in love. So Corel, you guys did awesome. Okay, so now there's all kinds of questions <laughs> that are coming in here. Um, one from earlier was a good one, and it was, what resolution do you recommend bringing your textures in as? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know if there is a limit. Maybe you can answer that one. Uh, I have found that if you're going to import them, you might as well import them large like you'd be doing for a wall portrait anyway so don't expect to bring in like a little tiny 2x2 two two and then print a 30 by 40 out of it so do your retouching and editing on your image for a large scale and uh, hide the background layer and then save that PNG um, and I think I had saved it as there's like an option and it's like small and the other one where it's like uncompressed or something and I do that uncompressed one or non-small. I know that's a terrible way to answer it, but I'm very, very no, new to this I, guy. You know, I guess it's, it's a hard one because whatever size you have your document set up as, and I, can't, I don't recall or if you showed us what size, you know, your canvas was, when you bring the texture in, whatever the dimensions and size of that texture, you want to make sure that that's going to suit the size of the canvas. So essentially, you don't want it to be too small, because if you use the scale brush to scale your texture up, you're essentially blowing the pixels out. So my recommendation is to you know, just align your texture size with the document size that you're working with. Yes. And I don't know if that helps anybody, but that's what I find is best. And then in the case of, you know, a texture that's more like a paper texture or a random kind of texture, leaves, flowers, that kind of thing, we have something called texture synthesis that will actually take a small size image and it will scale it up to the size that you want for you. So that's uh -huh. another new thing in 2018. It's not really going to work with something um, like a portrait of a person, but for more random types of backgrounds or other paintings you may have painted, it actually works quite well. Okay. Good to know. Let's see here. Um, I love these edges. 
and they're really good for calligraphy. They've totally changed how I do that. You know, this is an interesting question that I don't think I've gotten before, and I'm not exactly sure if I can answer it, but Susie okay. is wondering how the texture library will affect your file size or working efficiency. Um, the texture library, um, I you know what? I don't know if that actually bloats your document or not. I, um, you know if there's what? any other I'm not person sure. that knows, they can chime in in the questions maybe. But Yeah, I'm I not sure so. because I know that the textures are stored on your system. Um, but Susie, I'm going to have to follow up with that one. That's a good one. You stumped me here. And people were also wondering what Aaron's last name is. It's Aaron Rutten, R-U-T-T-E-N. Yes. And he has a ton of tutorials on his YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to <laughs> take Heather's recommendation and check that out, he's got a whole bunch of learning content there. And so does Heather. She has a lot Yay. of learning content as well. Absolutely. Great oils. I'm just playing with brushes here. <laughs> you know, Jeremy, um, Jeremy is asking, is there an easy way to rotate your brush while you're painting? And I don't know if you want to go ahead and take that one, Heather. Um, it's, I would think what e expression and... You know, it it's, depends it's on the brush. That's a tough depends. question. Uh-huh. Because it really depends, depends on the brush variant. You know, Wacom has the, um, the art pen that supports rotation, and many of our brushes support rotation, but you yes. might need the art pen in order to get the full rotation. So it's a special pen that you can get from Wacom. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm going to put infinite paint on this guy. If you want to set, if you have the art pen, um, the fastest way now to be able to turn your pen around and be able to rotate it and have the brush respond or the paint respond is to just change the angle of your brush and change the expression to, I think it's bearing or tilt, I think it's bearing. Uh, so you can see here as I'm turning my brush, it's actually turning with me. Um, so it gives you a little bit more of that like palette knife kind of feel. But I don't think the traditional pen does that because it doesn't pick up rotation sensitivity. Now, I think you typically can actually manually program it into your angle range and all that by numeric code if you don't have an art pen. Uh, it just won't pick up under expression meaning as you physically turn your pen. So I believe you can actually set that up if you do not have an art pen to follow numbers manually. Um, but if you have an art pen, it's just window. Brush control panel's angle is the um, direct way of getting it, if it has that. If you want to get it set up, let's see, um, or you could pick up advanced brush control panels. And hopefully angle, yep, angle's right there. So advanced brush control panels is this guy. And if angle is available on your brush, that should be able to help you turn your brush or have it, um, the expression be sensitive to when you literally physically turn your brush around and tilt it and all that good stuff. Great. Thanks, Heather. Sure. Judy is wondering, and I know you know you haven't sat and painted the entire photo here, but how would you handle where you had masked Gia the halo around her head? Oh, good question. Um, if you want to marry the two, eventually what I would have to do is just paint over with color. So find a brush that you're comfortable comfortable with. I like using chalk brushes or some kind of texture brush. So I have this little brush called um, Color Square Chalk that's based off of a brush and painter from their chalk variants. So you would sample a brush, uh, sample a color from the background, bring it into her head, sample a color from her head, bring it back over the background. And if you want everything to be nice and clean, you would have to make sure that that pickup underlying color is actually checked. And then just kind of marry those two edges together. 
And you can use that with your favorite brushes. Uh, you just need something that's going to give you some bit of control. So a nice round brush or a nice little chalk brush. And I did a really quick job masking her out. I am not sophisticated with my masking. So had I done a nicer job, that probably would be less of an issue. But still, bring your background in. D, B, D, B, drop a brush, drop a brush. Bring that hair back out. And she had been previously painted. I just kind of wanted to revisit her with the new brushes. Go. This is a good question from David, and he's he's saying that he's receiving a lot of photos from phones, which we all take pictures on today, and then they yes. want those images painted. So how would you recommend enlarging the images? There are a lot of um, good software and algorithms out there. So there's mm -hmm. like Resize, I know Topaz has a couple out there. Um, you can do it the old-fashioned way in Photoshop, uh, just increasing it by 10%, just a little bit at a time. And then once you've got that all nice and prepped and bringing it into Painter, when it's really, really small, I, I typically use a lot of heavy texture to mask how out of, you know, either out of focus or how lack of detail. A lot of texture will cover a lot of that up, um, but you'll have to do a little bit of freehand work or just make it a little bit more impressionistic. Um, but I don't think Painter has resizing uh, algorithms for that kind of sophistication, like plugins, like some other. No, no. I would do, I would recommend just as you did using something made for that purpose because Painter yeah. really is not. An image editor, it is. You can paint can photos, done. but sure. <laughs> but not necessarily for things like resizing. Yeah, and there's just different little plugins that you can Google, and um, I know Topaz does a really nice one. Um, but just the old school way in Photoshop would do it is uh, if you go to I think it's image image size and just increase the image by 110% and hit OK and 110% and hit OK, it, what it does is it takes the pixel and reads it and makes it larger just by 10% increments so you don't get that interpolation. Um, that's just a really old school way of doing it, but all the algorithms out there right now are so sophisticated you probably don't even need to do that. And then just keep stretching it until you kind of look at it really large on the screen and if it starts to break up then you've kind of reached the limit, but painting over it just covers so many, uh, you know, sins, if you want to call it that way, or just so many imperfections, um, especially when you start adding texture and expression and freehand work. So you've got a lot of um, uh, latitude there. Here we go. And then once I'm all done, I would definitely save this as a layered file and then save it as a PSD so I could go back into whatever image editing software I'm using and make my final adjustments before flattening it and save, uh, sending it over to my printer. So Everybody is she's a mess. very, oh, sorry, everybody's very interested in seeing, and I know we have this painting as the final, and it's on our website, but they're very Let's curious see. to see your final. Let's see, embedded. And this was not the background, but this was what I had um, before using all the brushwork. So that's my munchkin. <laughs>